Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am, as always, happy to be with you on this Tuesday. Um, if you are under a mandatory stay-at-home order like we are here in California, I hope everything is going well. If you are currently homeschooling, I really hope that everything is going well and that you are taking advantage of so many of the free offerings that are out there right now for entertaining and educating your kiddos while they are at home. I know my schedule feels totally thrown off um, and I don't know. I, I don't even have children to homeschool. I just have chihuahuas who refuse to homeschool. I don't know. They're very stubborn. <laughs> At any rate, I am excited to welcome author Naomi McDougal Jones to the podcast today. If you follow the GSMC movie podcast, you might have heard her interview with Tate and myself on that podcast. Last year, that episode actually aired on July 4th. If you're interested in hearing that episode, it is a GSMC movie podcast episode 138, subtitle Bite Me. That is the name of the movie that Naomi wrote and starred in, and I believe produced, if I'm remembering correctly, and it is about uh, real-life vampires. It's not as strange as it sounds, actually. It's really a very good movie, and it's very entertaining, and it's done with so much heart and humor and warmth, so that was when she was on the podcast in the, fir- the first time, and when she was there, she mentioned that she was writing a book, and so my little podcast book review host um, ears popped up, and I said, hey, when your book comes out, if you'd like to come back, I would love to talk to you about your book. And so she did come back, and we did talk about her book, which is called The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. Um. Generation after generation, women have faced the devastating reality that Hollywood is a system built to keep them out. The films created by that system influence everything from our worldviews to our brain chemistry. When women's voices are excluded from the medium, the impact on society is immense. Actor, screenwriter, and award-winning independent filmmaker Naomi McDougal Jones takes us inside the cutthroat, scandal-laden film industry, where only 5% of top studio films are directed by women, and less than 20% of leading characters in mainstream films are female. Jones calls on all of us to act radically to build a different kind of future for cinema, not only for the women being actively hurt inside the industry, but for those outside it, whose lives, purchasing decisions, and sense of selves are shaped by the stories told. Informed by the journey of her own career, by interviews with others throughout the film industry, and by cold, hard data, Jones deconstructs the casual, commonplace sexism rampant in Hollywood that has kept women out of key roles for decades. Next, she shows us the growing, women-driven revolution in filmmaking, sparked by streaming services, crumbling distribution models, direct audience access via innovative online platform, and outside advocacy groups, which has enabled women to build careers outside the traditional studio system. Finally, she makes a business case for financing and producing films by female filmmakers. That is the description of The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. It is fascinating. It is... um a little mind boggling at times. It is a little dreary, uh, depressing at times, Uh, but it is ultimately full of hope. You get all of that um, 
well, here's the story and here's what's been going on and here's what women have been going through for years and generations in Hollywood. And uh, it's not the, the bright lights and the sparkle that you see when you watch um, the Oscars or other awards shows. Uh, it's a lot darker than that. And you're thinking, oh, my gosh, this is just well, but that's not where that's not where she leaves it. And so you have to find out what is actually happening in order for her to then bring you all of the hope at the end and everything that's that's happening with women filmmakers. So let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Naomi because she can describe all of this so much better than I can. Again, the book is The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood, written by Naomi McDougall Jones. Hi, Naomi. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me back. I am very happy to have you here, and we are going to talk about your new book. Before we get to the book, though, if you could share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you. Sure. Um, So I, my name is Naomi McDougall-Jones, and I grew up in Colorado uh, and have lived in New York City for the last 13 years, although I just moved to Atlanta in November. And I'm an actress, writer, and producer of films primarily, uh, although I just my first book was just published, and um, I've made two feature films. The first one, Imagine I'm Beautiful, came out in 2014, and the latest one, Bite Me, came out in 2019. Yes, and that is where I first got to chat with you. Was uh, we Tate and I spoke with you on the GSMC movie podcast about Bite Me, yeah. uh, which is actually kind of a funny thing to say. Um, <laughs> so the new book is called "The Wrong Kind of Women," subtitled "Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood." Um, can you give an overview of the book? Sure. So basically. Um... of all of the films that you've ever seen in your lifetime, if you've watched mostly U.S. mainstream films, have been directed by men and overwhelmingly white men. 95% of all of the films you've ever seen. Uh, 80 to 90% of all of the leading characters that you've ever seen in films were men and overwhelmingly white men. And 55% of the time that you've seen a woman on screen, she was naked or scantily clad. So basically what that means is that All of cinema virtually has been shaped by white men, Um, stories from their perspective, mostly about them. And uh, that is a really big problem, not only for the women inside of the industry and who are trying to become directors and writers and actresses and everything else, but also for viewers of films. Because what that means is that these films that demonstrably shape everything from our career choices, to our professions, to our relationship status, to our sense of selves, to even literally our brain chemistry uh, is coming from this one monolithic perspective. Um, So the book is an attempt to explain how that is happening, how it is possible that women are graduating from film schools at 50% and yet are only directing 5% of studio films. Um, The impact that that's having on us as a society and in our brains and what we can do to fix it. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I watched uh, your TED talk last night on YouTube, and the the graphs that you that you show with you know women being fifty percent of of film school graduates, um, and then that number just keeps getting lower and lower and lower as they go out into the world and try to actually do what they've studied to studied for. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So what finally inspired you to write a book on the topic? Well, I sort of fell backwards into this subject matter at all. My my ambition from the time I was very small was to be an actress. That's what I went to college for. And I got out in the world and it and I didn't realize that this was an issue. Like a lot of people, um, I just watched movies and, and because all we've had is that white male version of cinema, it had just felt very normal. It it didn't occur to me at a young age that, that what we were seeing was such a slanted perspective. It just seemed like the perspective. And so I got out into the world and, you know, wanted to be Meryl Streep and play interesting, complex female characters and um, ended up 
spending most of my time auditioning for Naked Corpse number four and the very supportive girlfriend roles and got really frustrated with that, but still didn't understand yet that it was a problem of systemic sexism I thought well maybe just nobody's writing great roles for women I could write great roles for women so then I became a filmmaker and a writer and began making films and it and it was at that point as my colleagues my female colleagues and I set out to make films together that I I really understood the depth of the sexism that exists in the industry to the extent that people would just say these outrageous things to us in meetings just out loud in like 2011 and 2012, like, well, girls, you know, you're going to need to get a male producer on board at some point, just so that people will trust you with their money. And sort of this never ending refrain of nobody wants to see films about women, you're going to have to make something else, which Mm -hmm. didn't make any sense to me on its face, because women are 51% of the population and buy 52% of movie tickets. So you're saying so like what we don't want to see movies about ourselves, it just didn't make any sense. Um, right. So I and I was gobsmacked that this was happening, that these things were being said to us. And and particularly in Hollywood, which seems from the outside like such a liberal and forward thinking place, which I came to understand that it was not. So basically, I just started mouthing off about all this and Q&A's after my after screenings of my first feature film, Imagine I'm Beautiful in 2014 and was very quickly handed a global speaking career on this subject Um, because it was still at that I mean this was pre me too and everything and you know very very few people were willing to say these things out loud in public and I was just too dumb to know that saying them in public would be endangering my career (laughs) so they were sort of like well send that girl out she'll say anything Um, and then so that eventually led me to be invited to do a TED talk on the subject, which I did in 2016 in November. And then um, a year after that, the, the Harvey Weinstein story broke and, and TED.com put my TED talk on their homepage. It then went viral and a million people watched it in three months. And then um, a literary agent contacted me and actually said, you know, I've seen your talk and I think you have a book in you. And if you if you want to write it, I'll, I'll represent you. Um, so I said yes. And uh, he, I wrote a book proposal and he sold it and, and I received a publishing contract to write this book. Wow. That is, uh, that feels a little bit like um, kind of a tidal wave just sort of <laughs> wept you <Yeah>. along. <laughs> It never ceases to amaze and fascinate me how things can suddenly gain momentum and just kind of snowball from there. Uh, I just used tidal wave. Now I'm using snowball. I'm kind of mixing my weather metaphors. But let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. And when we come back, more with Naomi McDougall-Jones. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. And I'll be right back. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author, screenwriter, actor, producer, all-around amazing person, Naomi McDougall-Jones. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Talk about the relationship. You mentioned the Me Too movement. Um, Can you talk about the relationship between the book and the Me Too movement? Yeah. Well, so my, my advocacy and speaking and writing about this issue about the historic and current systemic exclusion of women from film predates Me Too and the Weinstein moment by quite a few years. 
Um, so it was sort of, it sort of, it sort of felt like that became a moment where the world suddenly turned to listen to this message that I and a number of other people had been shouting about for quite a long time and many women longer than I had. Um, so, but what it did was it gave us this opportunity where suddenly the world's attention did turn to this subject. And the book is actually only peripherally about the Me Too moment um, and about Weinstein. It's, it's really saying, okay, so we heard that story, those stories, and they were horrific, and, but, but that was really only the worst symptom of a culture and an industry that excludes and brushes off and degrades women at every level and excludes their voices and silences their voices. And so let's look at that bigger system and, and that that industry is putting out the content that then again goes on to shape the real world behaviors of the rest of us. So let's look at how that system is actually working. Um, so the book sort of takes the Me Too conversation a step further and says, how do we create an industry and a culture in which women are elevated and listened to at every level, not just once they're sexually assaulted? Mm, yeah. Um, <sighs> You did a lot of research for the book. I mean, there's a lot of um, statistics listed, and you did, I know, a lot of interviews. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the research process and how long did that process take, were, as well as were many women um, willing to speak with you, or were they a little leery mm. about it? Yeah. Um, so, yes, as you, I did over 100 interviews of mostly women and some men all the way up and down the industry in various roles in the industry, the famous, the not famous, and everybody in between women who had been in the industry and had had their careers crushed by the industry and had to leave the industry. Um, certainly there was a lot of reticence to speak to me. Um, I think it's, it's hard for people outside of the industry to grasp just how dangerous it is to speak about this stuff still. Um, uh, women's careers have been routinely black, blacklisted and destroyed throughout the history of cinema for speaking about this stuff. And there's, there's, sort, of a, there's sort of a patty cake version of this conversation that it's okay to have, like you're allowed to wear black to a ceremony if everybody else is, you're allowed in a moment when you win an award to make sort of a gutsy girl power speech about it. But if you actually begin interrogating um, how, the, if you begin talking about the fact that systemic oppression and exclusion is happening, if you begin interrogating exactly the mechanisms by which this is occurring, um, it, you, will, you will be blacklisted. Um, and so, Everybody is aware of that, or most people are aware of that. So a lot of people wouldn't speak to me at all. A lot of people would only speak to me on the condition of an anonymity. And so that what I, the deal I began making with, with people who would speak to me was that I said, well, say whatever you want during the interview. And if I use any of your material in the book, I will send you the passages that you're included in from the book before it's published. And you can decide at that point if you want to leave your name in or out. Um, so under that, uh, those guidelines, I did get over 100 people to speak to me, but I would say about 30 to 40 percent of them ultimately went anonymous in the book. Which makes sense. Um, and Which makes you, total you, Yeah, you speak at the beginning <laughs> of the book about being um, a straight, white, cis woman, um, which yeah. puts you in a different position than other other women or other uh you know let's say let's say the lgbt community or the trans community or uh actors who are disabled in some way um so talk a little bit about how you <laughs> how you wrote a book from that perspective trying to be inclusive but un understanding that you couldn't speak for every subset of people in the industry yeah i mean i well i think it's important to acknowledge, and I do this in my author's note at the very beginning of the book, as you say, to acknowledge that I am a straight, white, cis, able-bodied young woman, and that part of the reason I've been handed this microphone is for those reasons. 
Um, and I think, you know, movements and books <laughs> such as these do tend to elevate the experiences of people who look like me beyond people who don't. And that hurts uh, the people who don't look like me. And it uh, continues the propagation of the few slots being given to women who do look like me. So being aware of all of that and and nevertheless being given a microphone, what I tried to do to the best extent of my possibility was include stories and interviews and voices in the book at every level that aren't, that come from women who bring perspectives and experiences that are different than my own. Um, but also to say that as somebody who comes from my perspective, I, it, 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 I can't speak for them and it is impossible to encapsulate the full nuance of each group's struggles in a book like this. But I, to the best of my ability, I tried to shine my flashlight where the interview subjects took me and where the data took me in um, trying to peel apart not only the experiences that oppress all women, but also that oppress certain groups of women over others. Right. I mean, it's such a tricky line to walk because you have been given the microphone because of certain, you know, because of yep. certain things about you and your your um, who you are. But you don't you while well, you want to uplift and highlight, you don't want to speak for um, and kind of come across as that like. <laughs> I, I am white. Yeah. Listen to me. Um, you know, uh, it's totally, um, no, it, it, <laughs> it's super tricky. And it was, it was that, that, um, that difficulty was definitely at the front of my mind the whole time I was working on the book and my editor, Rikia Clark, and I talked extensively about how to handle that. Um, and ho hopefully I did the best I could. And, uh, and my my hope is that by speaking and by telling these stories that I was able to tell that it makes room and space for more women who don't look like me to speak for themselves because I definitely believe that this work won't be complete until we we hear from the stories from every kind of woman. Mhm. Mm and talk in the book of yes, uh you speak in the book about your own experiences um in what you call purgatory before you um, got a, a, a co-starring role, although all you did was scream, which I thought was hilarious that, that they could say that <laughs> speaking part. That's awesome. Um, so in the writing process, as you went through this, as you spoke to people, how was that? Was it, was it in any way triggering? Was it cathartic for you? I can't, I can only imagine that hearing so many stories and reliving some of your own experiences could have been a little difficult. Yeah, I would say it was both of those things. I I had been living with this subject matter and sort of, you know, talking to a, about it to people and hearing other people's stories for a number of years before I wrote the book. But it is really, really different to to know and then to sit down and listen to all of these interviews and write down in one place all of the things. And I've been hearing that from readers to now that the book is out of like it hits you <laughs> in a really different way to just sit down and and look at it all in one place versus sort of like hearing this fact here or this fact there. Um, and there were certainly times during the research and writing process that that brought me to my knees all over again. Um, and also, it 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 made me feel so vindicated and so hopeful and so active because I think part of, part of what's been going on is that we keep getting gaslit, right? <laughs> like there, there are these systems of oppression. There is the fact that somehow we get from 50% of women graduating film school to 5% of women directing studio films. And yet there aren't really serious conversations about how that's happening or um, what the experience on a personal level is of that happening to you. Like almost every woman I interviewed said to me at the end, you know, we'd gone through talking about all the different ways in which her career may, may have been affected by her, the fact of her being a woman. And then at the end, every single one would say to me, Oh, but you know, like 
it could also just have been my fault. Like maybe I'm not that talented or, you know, maybe I wasn't working hard enough, right? You know, I had these psychic hangups. <laughs> like that, that's so much part of the problem is like in all of this, you can, you can have this vague understanding that this, this is happening, but you still end up being told to blame yourself. And so I think when you look at the evidence as incontrovertibly and completely as it is in the book, it's, it's such a relief too to be like, oh my God, this is like, this is what I'm up against. And then once you understand that, it becomes so much easier to think about ways around and strategies through and saves you all the energy of self flagellation. Um, which is why I've come to believe that we should be teaching this stuff in film schools and in acting schools to both the women and men, because I think the fact that we just ignore that this is happening does such a grave disservice to the people who will get out of film school and experience this, this oppression and exclusion and diminishment, but not be, not have the context to understand that it's not their fault. See, now I did warn you that there were some dreary, very heavy topics going on in this book, and you've just gotten um, a, a view of those topics and how crazy and, um, well, messed up this industry is. When we come back, we'll be talking more about how this book relates to women in all industries, in all professions, not just the movie profession, the, the film industry. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to build that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Naomi was talking about the systemic nature of sexism in Hollywood and in the film industry. And of course, it doesn't just exist there. So let's go ahead and get back to the interview. And everything that you're saying, while your your book specifically focuses on the film industry, is true for women in pretty much every uh, walk of life. Um, so oh, 100%. we, we all have had, uh, I, I can imagine that we all have had these different levels of experience of being, you know, harassed or, um, gaslit or, or told we aren't good enough. And in some ways we internalize it. So even if readers aren't members of the film industry, they are going to recognize themselves in some of these stories. Yes. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from readers who will write to me and say like, I'm in finance, but this is exactly what happened to me where <laughs> I'm in. I got an email from a female construction worker in the Czech Republic who was like, this is my story. Uh, so it turns wow. out the hierarchy works in patterns. Um, yeah. And I would say to listeners who also aren't in the film industry, not only will you recognize yourself in our struggles of women trying to succeed within an industry, but again, it's so important that you understand how this is impacting you through what you watch, because it's not just about whether or not I can get a job. It's about the fact that our industry is creating these images and these stories and these stereotypes that are impacting real world behavior. 
Right. And especially now when we're all stuck at home and probably doing yeah. not much more than watching a ton of TV and movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, that's going to affect how we see things. And um, you speak a lot of the, in the book about how not only are we underrepresented, but then both male and female actors are, um, what, 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 what's the phrase, beauty, beauty work? Beauty work. Cool. Yeah. And I think we've yeah. all, we all have heard of that in some fashion. You know, we know that pictures are always touched up in fashion magazines, but the extent to which it, it goes on in the film industry, I was floored that they would, I guess maybe not floored. I mean, part of me was no, is no, not it is. surprised, it's, it's, it's <laughs> but the, the amount of hours and money they spend is crazy. Yeah. For those of you who may not know what, what we're talking Speaking about so beauty work is a technology that was developed actually for that film the case of Benjamin Button uh, the Brad Pitt film where he had his character had to be aged backwards and forwards by many decades throughout the course of the film um, and so basically it's a technology that allows them to digitally alter every frame of a movie <laughs> to the extent that they can um, you know, sculpt body parts. They can even put one actor's head on a on a different actor's body for an entire movie. Um, there's one amazing example of uh, an A-list male actor who plays a superhero in a movie, and he didn't like the way his crow's feet looked in the movie. And so they replaced his crow's feet with a younger actor's crow's feet for the entire movie, and nobody knew. And... I just can't imagine and, how tedious that would be. That's not oh the my job God, I right. want. Horrible job to be, have to do that. But but this <laughs> this is so ubiquitous now that that is that this is this incredibly expensive process is now put into the budget of basically every studio film and now a lot of the higher more prestige level television shows. So what's so damaging about this is that obviously Hollywood has be, been enforcing. Um, implausible standards of beauty on us for a long time but it's worse now because now we're seeing images of bodies and people that literally are not even possible on the physical body like it's just computer simulation but a most people don't know that right this is not a very this is a very well-kept secret in Hollywood and the only reason we know about it at all actually is that um, some of the beauty work technicians kind of spoke out in this 2014 Mashable article that like didn't was kind of squashed. You can, you can find the article online, but um, so, so a, most people don't know that this is true and B our brains aren't really set up to deal with that information. So you can look, even now that I've told you this, you can watch a movie and say to yourself out loud, that person is digitally altered. They do not look like that. And it will still make you feel bad about yourself because your brain can't actually grasp that that image isn't real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now I'm just. Now I'm just sad. Um, <laughs> so, so there's there's a lot in this book that that feels. Um, I don't want to say completely hope. Well, it, it, it at times can feel hopeless, but you talk uh, also in the book about hope. So let's let's move to that. <laughs> and can you yeah. talk about um, what you hope that uh, readers will take from the book and what where you're hoping we can move forward in this process? Yeah. So I I think, um, and again the the book the book is definitely not intended to be angry or hopeless or it's it's just to tell you the truth uh glorious the title of Gloria Steinem's new book is the truth will set you free but first it will really piss you off and I feel like that she's not wrong exactly, <laughs> she's not wrong and I feel like that is my book it's like you have to you have to understand this and we have to understand what we're facing and there is freedom and relief on the other side of that, but it, it does require, like, it is painful to, to look at what is true. Um, so, but the hope is in the fact that the, because of the internet and because of streaming and because of social media and also because of a, redu of a reduction in the cost of technology for film, it's actually possible now for 
women and people of color and the LGBTQ community and disabled folks and all these voices that have been historically just completely left out of cinema, we can now make our stuff on the fringes, totally outside of the system without the gatekeepers say so, and we can get them to global audiences also without gatekeepers say so. And this is a revolution that's already happening on the fringes, right? It's mostly happening like in web series and short films and micro budget feature films, but it's a growing movement. And this, the more that audiences get to taste this content, the more they will understand that there's more than just cauliflower, right? <laughs> like all they, all they're getting fed is cauliflower, but then if they just even get a taste of this other content, they go, wait a minute, there's broccoli and there's kale and there's this, oh my God, there's this whole perspective of the 70% of the population that isn't white men. Why are we watching only stories by and about white men? And so I think the more that that happens and the more that we're able to build an ecosystem for this content outside of the system, the more that audiences get the taste, the more that audiences understand this and begin voting with their dollars and eyeballs for this other content, um, the more this shifts. And I think this moment of insanity that we're in right now with coronavirus and the whole world getting disrupted, I think it's there's an opportunity as uh, not right now, but sort of in you know a couple months or six months or 12 months as we get through this, that everything about how everything is done is being shifted and transformed right now. And the film industry was already in a distribution crisis before two weeks ago. And so I think audiences and content creators have a real opportunity to find each other directly, remove these gatekeepers, remove um, the power from the existing stakeholders and and tell each other these stories that really matter and haven't been seen before. There, I think there is a shift, and that's encouraging. I mean, it, we're in the middle of it, so sometimes it's hard to see. But um, it, it, I feel like there is there there definitely is hope, and that's what I appreciate about uh, the the movement of the book is that it goes from this like, oh my lord, this is horrible, <laughs> to <laughs> there are things, and we are in a time when people can make space for themselves and go outside of the system because we have technology and the internet and everything else that we yeah. have that can enable us to have our voices heard. Okay, time for our final break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about what Naomi is working on now. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Naomi McDougall-Jones. So what are you working on now? Are you working on a new movie? Do you think you'll write another book? Um, I have, I'm on the 11th draft of a new, of my third feature film, which is uh, tentatively titled Hammond Castle. And is about a seven-month pregnant woman who gets locked overnight in a castle full of famous ghosts. Um, we have been hoping to shoot that in 2021. The world is upside down right now, so who knows if that will be true. But um, I have a directing team attached and a producer, and we're, we're moving forward with that. And yes, I, I definitely want to write another book. Um, I think I think I have an opportunity right now as. <laughs> A lot of the world mm -hmm. stands still to think more about that and start working on that proposal. But I, um, I think the first book uh, 
is very much about looking at the structures that are keep holding us back and sort of how this system works and how it works to keep us out and what we can do to it to attack and find ways around and get through that system um, and I think the next book is likely to be sort of about what the work is that we have to do to deprogram ourselves to be able to really radically build a different future because we also were raised in this sexist and racist society just like everybody else and there is work that we have to do also to not just recreate the systems of oppression that we have experienced. Mm -hmm. So you came to uh, writing a, a book from a, a kind of different different direction than some people might, but you obviously are a writer. You you know you write screenplays, etc. So do you have advice uh, not only for aspiring authors but aspiring writers? Um, just do it. <laughs> I guess sort of my my message to artists in general and specific, particularly those who have not traditionally been chosen by the establishment is just that you, you, you cannot allow anybody else to decide the value of your work and the, and the worth of your voice. And that, I mean, particularly in the film world, but this is true in so many art fields to, to understand this, as I hope this book helps people understand that the system is designed not to pick you, but that doesn't mean that your voice isn't worthwhile. It means your voice is incredibly worthwhile and incredibly important and in that it's actually, you have a civic responsibility to make sure that you do tell your stories anyway. And even if it's finding ways around, even if it's on the fringes, even if it's sort of in these radical new modes of getting content directly to audiences that you, that we, we so desperately need to break out of this monolith of the white male perspective and we need your stories. So please, please, please find a way of telling them and getting them to, to readers or viewers or whatever your medium is. And I, I imagine maybe you would give similar advice to someone who was thinking about going into acting or how, how would you, how would you talk to someone from, from your yeah. perspective now? Um. I mean, yes, it's a little bit different for actors because you are at the mercy. You can't do your art until somebody picks you, which makes it a particularly and uniquely challenging artistic profession. Um, but I would say a lot of actors also become storytellers. And I don't, I think if that's in you, definitely consider that. I I have acted in my own movies, even as I've become also a storyteller, and that has been way more gratifying than than playing roles that people picked me to do. Um, but even if you find that you're not a writer, or you're not a director, that you can find artistic collaborators who value you beyond how actors are often valued, and but as true artistic collaborators and participants in the process, and make work with them. Um, I think, and also please read my book before <laughs> before you go into acting so that you <laughs> just understand what it's okay to say no to and what you will likely be asked to do before you are in the moment and being asked to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually ask people who their favorite authors or, and or genres are. Uh, I'll I'll tweak that a little bit for today. What are you reading during COVID-19 <laughs> when you're stuck in the house? <laughs> um, well, I just finished reading The Overstory, um, which is the perfect book to read during COVID-19. I had, I started reading it before, but um, it's like everybody should read this book right now. It's, it, it won the Pulitzer last year. It's fiction, but it's, it's like one of the most important books I've read in the last 10 years. It's, a, it's about uh, sort of why trees are so important, but told through these seven people's lives in a way that is impossible to explain, but is pretty transformational. Um, and now I'm reading Hilary Mantel's third book in the, in the Wolf Hall series, which is 900 pages. So I feel excited that it will keep me going a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's. Are you reading it as an actual book or on an e-reader? On an e-reader. Okay, I was going to say because you know, it's it, 900 pages is kind of hefty when you're trying to read. You have to find ways to prop yeah. them up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Naomi, I know you have a website, so if you can uh, share your website and where people can interact with you, uh, if you're on social media. Yeah, my website is Naomi McDougalljones dot com. Um, I'm on all the social media. Those links are on my website. Um, and you can also on my website sign up for my newsletter. I won't annoy you, but I do send out cool updates, uh, usually about once a month, um, about what I'm writing or working on or movies I have coming out or whatever. So uh, if you want to stay tuned, sign up on my website. Thank you. We've talked about um, quite a few different things, but is there anything that we have not covered that you would really like to say at this point um, about the book or um, the writing of it? Anything that we haven't covered? I don't think so. It's been great. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. The book is out now, um, so people can get that on their e-readers and, and read while they're stuck at home. Um, and just thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you once again to Naomi for joining me a second time on a different podcast to talk about her new book, uh, The Wrong Kind of Women. I found it fascinating. I found it, I mean, I wasn't surprised at some things and I was very surprised at others. So there's information in there that I was not aware of and information in there that I unfortunately was aware of and everything in between. But I loved the, the, the conclusion or the, the, the final section where she talks about what is going on, this movement amongst women filmmakers and amongst uh, people in general who are supporting women filmmakers and what we can do to support women in film. And there is, this is just, this is the right time because there's so many opportunities. There's, there's so many platforms open that did not used to exist. So, um, that used to not exist. What anyway? Whatever. Um, so that there is hope, and there are ways that we can make those numbers better, so that five percent can grow to be more representative of the fifty percent of women who graduate from film school. So, thank you to Naomi not only for joining me, but for writing this book and for being brave enough to speak out and talk about what's going on in an industry where it is not encouraged, of course, to talk about what is going on. And um, it's actually a little bit dangerous to your career to talk about what is actually happening in the film industry. So thank you to Naomi. Thank you, as always, to you. I hope that you are staying safe. I hope that you are staying home. I hope that you are not hoarding toilet paper. I hope that you are reading up a storm, that all of this uh, stay-at-home time has given you plenty of time to get yourself lost in lots of good books. Talk to you next time. Next time. Yes. Sorry. When, uh, uh I'm not done. I, I said talk to you next time, but I'm not done. I've got a bunch more stuff. Uh, <laughs> not a bunch, but I need to wrap up. Join me on Friday when I will be speaking with author Greg Hickey about his new book, The Friar's Lantern. And this one has a bit of a twist. I'm not going to tell you now. You have to tune in to find out what that is. Made me go, Ah, interesting. Um, so definitely tune in to hear that interview. In the meantime, if you are a fan of this podcast, please do subscribe. Give us a nice review. We'd love a five star or a written review if you are so inclined in this time when you have nothing else to do because you're staying home. Um, make it a homework assignment for your kids. <laughs> Whatever works. Follow us on social media. Do all of those lovely internet-y type things that help us out um, so wonderfully and help us to get this podcast to more people. Now I'm wrapping things up. Take some time. Get yourself lost in a good book. Stay safe. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.com. 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.